was just one of those things just one of those crazy flings one of those bells that now and then ring just one of those things hello everyone i'm captain logan and uh one welcome to another exciting uh interview geeks not nerds podcast things. today i'm chatting with a uh fascinating guy and uh, somebody who has seen more of the world and met more fascinating people than anybody I have ever sat down and chatted with before. He was a stage actor, set and costume designer on uh, on and off Broadway for uh, a long time. He worked on the costumes for the first Star Trek, the first four Star Trek films. He worked on the Last Starfighter. He worked on the original Fright Night. Yeah, there's been a Fright Night remake. Uh, he worked on North and South for television, and he has worked on stage and on screen with legends like Dean Martin, Carol Burnett, William Faulkner, Orson Welles, Jack Palance, and Phyllis Diller, who I understand you were uh, good friends with. Yeah. Uh, he was Emmy Award nominated, he won a Saturn, and he is the recipient of the 2005 Motion Picture Costume Design Guild Lifetime Achievement Award, and he has written a memoir that came out a couple years ago called A Trunk Full of Yak Hair, or How the Klingons Got Their Look. I welcome with me today Mr. Robert Fletcher. Bob, thanks for being here. Well, thanks for asking me, as they're saying all day up now on the news. I watch a lot of it, and it's full of interviews. And mm -hmm. People say, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm pleased you asked. They many variations of it. Did you, like, before the interview, rehearse those? Like, decide which one you were going to grab onto? Because no. you had, like, 16 <laughs> different variations. You're like, thanks for... No, thanks for... Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, I Robert... Robert, I am uh, really glad to get to meet you. This is a real um, fortuitous, uh, strange, odd kind of encounter. Uh, a, a mutual friend of ours is who's sitting right here with us. Um, uh, Jennifer, uh, of course, knows you from the uh, Kansas City... Uh, costume, company. help me out, company. Thank you very much. And uh, you've been working on uh, costume designs for them for how long now? Over 25 years. Wow. I think it was 25 years. I came here every summer and designed for the St. Louis Muni Opera. Sometimes the entire season, sometimes two or three, but the season was usually seven shows. And uh, I haven't kept count, but it uh, certainly added up to a, has added up to a great many times. And that's why when I look for a place to get away from everything, I thought of Kansas City, which I came to love over that time. And during that period you were living primarily in New Mexico? Primarily in Taos. New Mexico. Do you know Taos? I don't. Well, you should. <laughs> no, it's, it's a delightful, old, essentially Mexican town. It, 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 uh, it's 8,000 feet up in the mountains. Wow. And it is still built very much on the foundations that were set down in the uh, 16th century. From, uh, and it's a, a, an art colony, the first art colony in America, as it's a matter amazing. of fact. That's perfect for somebody like you, yeah. Yeah, it was. It, it still, it started around the turn of the century, the last century, as being an art colony, a colony where painters chose to go and live, and uh, been that for a hundred years. So mentioning the Muni, um, my wife is from St. Louis and yeah. has seen numerous shows there. I still haven't had a chance to, to go. I really wanted to see the producers when they had that there um, a few years back. Did you did you happen to work on that play? Yes, mm -hmm. we did. Steve, who is the owner of the Kansas City Costume Company, I'm sure has a better memory of them than I did because... Hi, Steve. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank you. I <laughs> I was um, so busy. I want other random people to just come out of the woodwork, you know. <laughs> I was I was trying to get the season done that I have no real memory of. I, I have no listing in my mind. 
but I'm sure Steve does. It was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, let's go ahead and get a little bit into uh, your early days. You did a lot of acting early on in your career, but at some point you decide, uh, I'd rather work behind the scenes. And you say in your memoir that you gave up acting in favor of design because you felt like you had, you had, to, you had to kind of put yourself out there too much. You had to give, give up too much of, of yourself. I hated going for interviews as an actor. I usually got the job, but I loathed it because uh, I felt, how dare they ask me these questions? Of course I can do the job. (laughs) And uh, as a designer, I didn't have to open my heart to the the producers. I had to simply show them my portfolio, and it was a lot less uh, emotional. But what really uh, set me to designing is this little story I think I told in my book about Nancy Marchand. You know who she is? I don't. Well, did you ever see um, the thing about the mafia? Oh, yes. I, you know, I do, The Sopranos. And, the now, Sopranos. and now, that, now that you say it, I remember you talking about her in your book, right? And you, and you worked with her decades, of course, before, yeah. this, before she was in The Sopranos, right? Yeah. I hired her for a theater that I founded in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She was one of our first actresses. And you helped open a playhouse that you, that, yeah. that you had for six years. Right. She was such a wonderful actress. It was a privilege to have her. But I remember one particular night when we were playing uh, George Bernard Shaw. I can't remember the name of the play. But I was playing her son, and she was playing my mother, and she was younger than I was, of course. (laughs) Uh, I had done the costumes uh, set in the Revolutionary War in America. We had a very nice shop to build the clothes. We had a full crew, as a matter of fact, about 10 people uh, all year long. Uh, Anyway, at the intermission, Nancy said, Bobby, come here. (laughs) And I said, yes, yes, Nancy, what is it? She said, why were you not looking at me during that last scene? I said, well, Nancy, I certainly was looking at you. She said, you were not. You were looking at my hemline. And I realized I had been looking at her hemline and not at her. So, and you were more interested in the clothes than you were the performance. Yes. So that was what really set me off. Decided. So when we closed the theater, everybody went to New York or some other place. Uh, by the way, we had three theaters operating at one time on this Brattle Theater Company, it was called. We had one in Cambridge and two others in New England. And we took things into New York four or five times, and they ran. As a matter of fact, uh, Miss Alliance ran for two years. Uh, And I both played in that, designed it, and was stage manager. Took it on tour for a year. Did you find yourself designing most of the plays you acted in? At that theater, yes. Yeah. Yeah. We had 87 productions, as yeah. a matter of fact. You said 87 or maybe more. Maybe more. Uh, but you... But, so, so at that time you, you stopped acting, but uh, as you say in your book, things tend to kind of come back around again, <laughs> and much later you would occasionally find yourself having to come back and act again. And I liked this line. You said, seldom what you think is last is the last of anything. Yeah. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, As a matter of fact, yeah. I thought I was through designing, but I've just spent the last couple of weeks doing a... Grease. Yeah. No, a... Uh, new no pro- a new production of Grease <laughs> for the Starlight. Possibly. Oh, fantastic. Right? Yes. Mm-hmm. 
So I got to ask you this because of the myriad Shakespeare productions that you've been involved in, and uh, there are some names, some familiar names connected to Star Trek that uh, we'll talk about later that are connected to Shakespeare and your uh, involvement with Shakespeare productions. It seems like it all comes back to Shakespeare in Star Trek and every other facet of uh, of entertainment. Which would you say is your favorite Shakespeare play, just subjectively, and which was your favorite Shakespeare play to work on? All of them. Well, I venture to say you've worked on the majority of them. I think 17 or 18. Wow. But, but there, aren't there over 30? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but so at least half. Yeah. And of course, several, several times, because I know yeah. you did a couple different, different productions right. of, of, right. of Othello, uh, including one with James Earl Jones. They just done a, a, an exhibit at the Harvard Theater Library on Othello, and they uh, have all my sketches. I was going to ask you about that, and and if and if any of those were, if it was possible to see them, if anyone were to go there. Well, they're pretty snotty about it, I must say, but it is possible. See. <laughs> And they want to charge. Who knows the number of hoops and how many would be on fire, but it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Harvard was a very peculiar place. Because when I... Matri- mat- what do they call it? Matri- mati- matriculated yeah. there. They had no theater department. They uh, thought it was not uh, worthy of... Um, academia. Academia, as they saw it. And I'm happy to say that in the years I've, since I've been there, which is over 70, or what is it, 45, from 45 to now, uh, they've changed their minds and they're opening a an actual academic theater department. But it took that long. Yeah. And uh, they have actually... De- they're also having the Department of Theater Design, I believe. That doesn't mean that there hasn't been a theater there all the time. But you couldn't major in it. Right. You couldn't get the piece of paper. Right. Which I think is pretty silly most of the time. Because yeah. it's not the sort of thing that, that you can learn. You have to be born for it, I think. Well, and that is a wonderful segue to uh, my next question, which is, what what was it? Because early on uh, in, in your book, you talk about uh, how you kind of floundered and weren't really sure what you wanted to do with yourself, but you always wound back up in entertainment and performance. And I, I, I find that really interesting because it seems like that's kind of in your blood, and it seems like it took you a while to figure out for sure that that's what you wanted to do. What was it that finally made you go, yes, of course? Was it that group at Harvard? Yeah, well, yes, of course, but it, it, I wasn't pushed into it. It sort of flowed. There was no moment saying, oh, this is it, you know. It yeah, just, I mean, your father was a famous actor, but he didn't primarily raise you. And when well, you got to New York, he didn't. and when you got to New York, you didn't even uh, have those kinds of contacts anymore because he'd already left. We did, when I first um, met him, I deliberately went backstage when he was playing in a uh, during the war I was in the uh, air corps and on leave I went into New York and <clears throat> bought a ticket and went backstage after the performance it was something called it was by a very famous playwright George S. Kaufman, The Land is Bright. Have you ever heard of it? I haven't. No. It's named after a, a quote from Churchill of, Look west, for the land is bright. And it was about the war. And, and uh, damned if I can remember anything about it. <laughs> uh, anyway. And of course he had no idea that you were there. No. And his mind was blown no. when, you, when you came back. Yeah. Back to but see him. He treated me very, very well. Mm-hmm. There's more than I can say for him in the future, but 
I wanted to ask you about a quote, uh, this is again pretty early uh, in your book, that seems to be kind of a, a mantra for costume designers, uh, the, way you, the way you describe it. Uh, you, you, you said, you, you talked a little bit about Edith Head, and you said that uh, she would often say, don't sew and don't carry your costume. And why is that? Why, why is it that costume designers so should If you want to be a designer. If you want to be a designer, right. Don't sew and don't carry costume. Why, why is that? Well, that's the wardrobe department. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you, if you sew, she meant you get stuck in sewing because um, it's so complex and takes so much concentration that if you begin to, you can't get out of it. You're in a swamp. She always said, to her, carrying costumes was demeaning, and you mustn't be known as a costume carrier. How much of that did you realistically find yourself having to do, though? None. None? No. I am not a sewer, and you know that. <laughs> You have uh, obviously created costumes for copious play, uh, plays and works uh, for the screen. We were talking a lot about uh, about the stage, um, but but uh, can you can you compare the mediums a little bit for me? What is the difference between uh, between designing costumes for stage where people are some people are farther back in the audience and uh, versus versus for film where you're gonna you're gonna be shooting it close up and you might see those those uh, intricate details. Is well, there a difference? I've never considered that there was any difference. You, a good costume is a good costume. Whether it's five feet away or 50 feet. So you're not thinking, I don't need that level of detail because people aren't going to be that close have. to it. Have I? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I don't know that I, I like that you surrounded yourself with people to keep you honest. That's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and get into Star Trek a little bit. Um, first of all, of the four, because uh, you worked on motion picture, Rathcon, Search for Spock, and The Voyage Home, of the four, uh, which which would you say, and, and I'll ask you the same question I did about Shakespeare, which would you say is subjectively your favorite film, just looking at it as a movie, uh, and which was the most enjoyable to work on? I've never really thought about that. Um, yeah. Uh, the search for Spock. There was a little more th scope, more more challenges, and also I had more contact with uh, Spock. I know we got on very very well. And Leonard Nimoy, right? Who you got to work with yeah, twice, Leonard, twice, right? Because he directed Voyage right. Home as well. Yeah, he was my favorite person connected with Star Trek. Uh, or Robert, also Robert Wise, mm -hmm. who I've always considered one of the most versatile directors in Hollywood. Yeah, you know that you could go from a musical to a, to a science fiction thing to a. Yes. These days, so many directors have a style, and Robert Wise, you could never tell one yeah. apart from the other. You know, sound and music versus motion picture versus. Yeah. The day the Earth stood still, which is science fiction, but looks nothing like the motion picture. You know, he's working in an entirely different. Yeah. Area, yeah. What would you say are the biggest differences between those th between those three directors and working with those three directors, with with Robert Wise to Nicholas Meyer to Leonard Nimoy? Wise was like working with my father. He was gently moving me along to do what he wanted, and Leonard was like working with my brother, and. I didn't know it at the time, but he was from a suburb of Boston where the Brattle Theatre was located, and he was a patron of the Brattle Theatre during all the time and had seen me act. Oh, wow. <laughs> and did he, he remember that? Did I? Did he, did he remember yeah, that? Yeah, he remembered it. Yeah. And he very kindly didn't tell me what he thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, and we we were both actors, mm -hmm. and he we got along possibly because of that. Um, Meyer was Meyer's more of a writer. Yeah, yeah, but um, 
and cold, kind of a cold personality. Really? But I found maybe it was just to me, but he had uh, directed a number of operas, and he loved classical music. But the minute I mentioned an opera or talk, talk, approached him through an opera, he froze and would not pursue it. I wonder why that was. I have no idea. Was it just because that's not what we're working on? He doesn't want that to, to affect him too much? I mean, but considering all the culture, uh, you know, especially like literary culture and stuff that affects well, Rath of Khan, what I mean, you, wouldn't, I you wouldn't think he'd be, he'd, be, he'd, be, he'd be, you know, not wanting to think about that stuff. It was like, but he, uh, he just didn't want to be personal. Do you want the uniforms a little more like uh, Carmen? Or do you want, you know, <laughs> that's the kind of thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. And he just wasn't going in for that? No. That's really strange. Isn't it? Yeah. But he did say that he wanted them more military. Right, and colorful. And colorful. So uh, talk a little bit about the, I mean, I, I guess I can't even say evolution, because it's not like you took what you had in motion picture and with, with, the, with the Starfleet uniforms and transformed them into what you had. In, it was two entirely different kinds of projects. But talk a little bit about the, um, about the kind of uh, logic and reasoning behind why we have those kind of more, if you'll forgive me, you know, drab-colored one-piece suits from motion picture to uh, the, the, the red suits that we get in Rathacon that carry through all the way up through sex. Well, it was simply trying to uh, service the director. Robert Wise didn't want anything to interfere with the face. And you notice so much of the way it's shot is uh, close-ups and so on. Yeah. Uh, one thing, he, he gave the go-ahead. He wanted the lobby at this, in the Star uh, Fleet yeah, the, to be full the of aliens. Force. So I spent a fortune making aliens. And you said you had a million dollar budget yes. or something close to that. That floored me. Well, Just for costumes. Well, that's not unusual. Is it not? No, not for a big movie. Wow. What do you think costumes cost? Well, I just... I, and, and I, and Don't I guess, go and order yourself one. <laughs> Well, I guess uh, looking looking back on motion picture, I, I know it was a really ex- extravagant, you know, you know, um, exorbitant amount of money that was spent on that movie, and I just assumed that um, generally you would maybe have half that. No, I I never really was pinned down. I must say they were very good. Paramount, a million dollars is really very little for a film production budget and it's gotten worse yeah by far they've used them continuously ever since on uh, in TV productions uh, I have a letter from Bob Blackman thanking me for having made so many costumes which he found very useful <laughs> yeah yeah I'm sure there's a lot of recycling and yeah. reusing for different for different things and for, we did that for, a lot with props and stuff of course for TV yeah mm-hmm uh, and I don't know if you're aware of this. Uh, and I was going to ask you if you've if you've ever checked back in with Star Trek at all. You know, if you've if you've ever come back and, and, and just just looked at any of the the series and films. The post, only post one I've seen is the last one. Uh, Beyond. Beyond. Yeah. How did you feel about that? Too loud. Yeah. Too noisy. <laughs> uh, and too. Inarticulate. There's no, no dialogue. Nothing. Explosions. Compared to the uh, to, to the first film in that particular franchise, though, it feels like everyone is speaking in soliloquies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you won't be aware of this, but I uh, the, the the red costumes um, from Wrath of Khan going going forward uh, pop back up a few times. In, yeah. in in the uh, in in the series, and there, there's an episode of Voyager uh, where George Takei comes back and uh, reprises Sulu and uh, plays the the captain from Six. And I don't know if you ever if you ever even uh, watched the the two I'm after. Not you. against them. I sure, just, sure. You just haven't actually time. watched them. Yeah, uh, I've been too busy watching British TV. That's fair. There's a lot of great British television. Yeah. 
But uh, but yeah, they, they they do they do an episode where the the two or excuse me, there's a character named Tuvok who's the Vulcan in that show, and he uh, does a mind melt where he takes his mind back into the past, and we find out retroactively that he served on the Excelsior with Sulu, and uh, they bring those costumes back, and, and and George Takei is a figment of his imagination, and then uh, there's also an episode uh, before that called Tapestry where uh, where where uh, Patrick Stewart is is wearing one. Good, yeah. <laughs> I was curious because you don't mention this in your book, and you may not be aware of this, uh, so I don't mean to put you on the spot. But I was, but I was just curious if, if you uh, knew anything about the production of the television series before motion picture happens that became motion picture, because originally uh, it was supposed to be a TV show called Phase Two, and apparently they were pretty well along in production before Par- Paramount finally changed their minds and decided to make a big budget film, and they had built suits, or excuse me, they had bu- they had built sets already that were never used, and I was curious to know if you knew about that and if uh, they had made any costumes well, and if there was any discussion about the costumes they had made for the show to what you did. I didn't know that there were any costumes made for the show. Yeah, I don't know if there are either, but I know they built sets, so it just stood to reason that maybe they had and already started on costumes. I not aware of design. that either. Uh, we were just presented with these enormous sets Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the about the Klingon design, of course, which is um, in the title of your book. And uh, you are really one of the unsung heroes in Star Trek uh, lore because if you if you go in and you look at all the Star Trek that came after you, um, we have built so much on just what you did in that first movie. Uh, the 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 forehead, the, the Klingon foreheads, which kind of um, with, with you started as, as kind of a crustacean thing, turned into more of what we what we call now the turtle head. Exoskeleton. The exoskeleton, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I was actually thinking of that. I don't know if you're aware of just how revolutionary that was, but we have we have people who dress up in Klingon costumes, who speak the language created by Mark Okrand, who uh, go to go to conventions and like live it and breathe it. And if you hadn't designed them the way you designed them, based on a thing you did for The Tempest with Jack Palance, we would not have. Who, by the way, would have made for a great Klingon? Would have made the perfect Klingon. You, you, uh, we, we would, we would not have the Klingon culture the way yeah. we have it. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people were just inspired by that look to create the rich culture. Well, that was, I was inspired to make a <coughs> chalk sketch of this Klingon head. When I was talking to the father of us all... Um, Gene Roddenberry. Gene Roddenberry, right. Because he had conceived of this malevolent... Alien, till my sketch was used, he he had no visual, and he said, "I I don't want him to be strange and funny and alien. I want him to be just it could be like somebody next door who's just a little bit evil." (laughs) (laughs) That's a decent impression of Rod (laughs) Mary, Mister Ed. You mean? And uh, I was, I wanted to do something different. And I wanted to make an alien. And when I imagine without you, they would have just looked basically like they did in the series. Yeah. So I really went to, to him and I took this chalk sketch and I said, it should at least be this uh, alien, you know. Because people want to have fun. Come on. Yeah. If you just want to make everybody look like everybody else, then you're doing the wrong show. And he bought my argument. Then I went further and made further sketches. And his one contribution is, he said, well, could there be some fur on it? And I said, okay, have fur arms. Yeah, and we put we put fur and hair on every alien species in the original series. You've got the Andorians with their big pink frills all over the place, yeah. and yeah, so that doesn't surprise me at all. But of course, he also I, I imagine asked for facial hair because they had that in the original series. No, he didn't. 
but I did. I oh, okay, a, okay. I put it on. in your in your book. I thought you had a you had a place where you mentioned that he that he asked for beards and things, but I could be mistaken. I don't. And then you said, it, and, and then you said, oh, okay, so like a so like a so like a big hairy like crustacean or something. I forget. Yeah. Well, it, it was it was a, a hairy lobster. Hairy lobster. That's what you said. Yeah. yeah. And I was really thinking of uh, lobsters. I mean, they the lobster has its skeleton on the outside. So the logic is you pursue that to a civilization that is derived from people with their skeletons on the outside. And we took that idea uh, that you came up with there and ran full tilt with it uh, in the series. When you get to Next Generation, uh, based on that idea, uh, we, we discover that the Klingons have redundancies for every organ. Uh, they apparently even have a backup brain just in case that breaks down. Uh, and there are places where we get to see their um, their spines and uh, like the like like well, the like the front and it, you know the sternum, and uh, it's all based in that that structure with this video exoskeleton. Mostly, mm-hmm. it's the overlapping. Right. Yeah. Well, and of course, but I guess that, you did that first, didn't you? Because that's yeah, that's yeah a, because you put that on the back of that car. I forgot all about that. That's right. Like people symbolizing their origins in their future fashions. Yeah. Uh, which is an idea we continue with a lot of other species too, mm-hmm. in, in with with other with other aliens, where we start making the, with Deep Space Nine, yeah, the Cardassians, we start making the architecture based on the, on on their on their big uh, necks and things, and so um, that's a that's a big idea we've continued all the way through Star Trek. I, I know you didn't spend a whole lot of time with him, but but what what was your um, what was your take on Gene Roddenberry when you when you met him and when you talked to him? What was he like in person? I don't know what to say. He was, uh, I didn't spend that much time with him. Sure, I yeah. was never very in, intimate, uh, but uh, he was never mean to me. <laughs> well, I had to ask. I've never had a chance to sit down one, one-on-one with someone who, who, who actually talked directly to Gene Roddenberry. So. No, he was... Uh, we respected each other, I think. Uh, Did he seem kind of larger than life? Did he seem real charismatic? Or was he just kind of a business person? He seemed like an artist to me. I would not... He classify him as a business person. His wife is a different story. Yeah. Here's Angel this, Barrett. Uh, is she still alive? No, she passed away four or five years ago. I think so. Or, or no, it's been longer than that. She passed away just before the uh, first Abrams movie came out in 2009. Uh, she, to- was, she thought only of money. Wow. And comfort, I would say. Uh, have have you ever uh, seen her act in anything, no. besides besides those films? She was a nurse, wasn't she, or something? Like well, she was an actress. Was she? Yeah, and I mean, she played Nurse Chapel, so she played a nurse. I don't know if she ever was a nurse. I think I think I think she was at one time, uh, but she uh, she was in a lot of Star Trek uh, after oh, those I films. Know. Yeah. Talk a little bit about um, about how you developed the uh, costumes for the Vulcans, which I felt like were uh, much closer to the things we had done in uh, 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 Amok Time and Journey to Babel in the original series. Uh, the Klingons, you went full tilt, totally different direction, but it seems like the Vulcans, you, you, you kind of worked a little bit with what was there already. Or did you just happen to make something that looked real similar? I don't remember ever seeing the Interesting. Vulcans before I did. What I did, yeah. Maybe it, maybe it was inevitable. The word, word Vulcan produced that effect. Did I put anything in the book about uh, Judith Anderson? A little bit. A little bit. Mm-hmm. Previously, before Star Trek, and uh, she came to Brattle and worked for us. She was a wonderful woman. But, and a wonderful actress. I was thrilled when they cast her as his mother. Mm-hmm. And when she came for the first fitting, producer was waiting outside the fitting rooms at Paramount for us to be finished. Of course, to be shown something. And Judith and I got so busy gossiping I forgot he was there <laughs> so she finished the fitting 
and went home and he was still waiting to see the costume. <laughs> I was very embarrassed. Toward the end of the 80s. I had just yeah, done exactly. a production for her of mm -hmm. Hamlet, in which she played Hamlet. That, I remember you mentioning that in the book. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a gender flip I had never heard of anybody doing before. Oh, yeah. Well, if, uh, what's her name? The French actress... Uh, Charlotte Shark? No. no. <laughs> Sarah Bernhardt? Sarah Bernhardt. Sarah Bernhardt. Yes. She's French. And I did a, a ballet for Lincoln Kirsten mm -hmm. uh, based on Bernhardt's life. That was the fourth time I did a costume for Hamlet. A ballet, a movie and twice or three times on, as a play. Before we get to the next thing I was going to ask you about, um, I want to go back to the Klingons for just a second and say that I hope at some point uh, you, you get the chance to sit down and watch Star Trek VI because of Christopher Plummer. And I don't know if you're familiar with Christopher Plummer's role in VI, but, uh, but Plummer plays the Klingon bad guy in that film, uh, General Chang. In what? In Star Trek VI, in The Undiscovered Country. And uh, this would have been 91, 92. And uh, Christopher Plummer plays a, a uh, Shakespeare-obsessed Klingon. I mean, we take it all the way back full circle. And I, the thing I found most fascinating uh, about your work with Star Trek, reading your book, was that, the, as I said earlier, that the Klingons start f because of something that you did in Shakespeare in the first place because then when we get to six and I don't know that this would have happened uh, if you hadn't designed that based on uh, the the, uh, the Caliban outfit because uh, when you get to six we have Christopher Plummer who you also worked with uh, who played Mark Anthony in a, in a, in a stage production um, uh, of I Julius Caesar one whole season with him did you people, really? Uh, at Stratford when he acted uh, directed and terrorized the whole summer. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sure you knew. I won't go into Christopher Plummer. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, maybe you don't want to watch Star Trek VI then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think he's a great actor. He really is good. But there's difference between people and acting. Yeah. I'm thinking of other people in your book that you had difficulty even writing their names down, so I won't bring up any of those people. If you hadn't left L.A. toward the end of the 80s, do you think you might have uh, found yourself working on the last two Star Trek projects? I have no idea. Because it seemed to me like uh, just the timing, that seemed to be the only reason you weren't involved in, in, in Five. But you didn't have a chance to work with Shatner as a director. Just, <laughs> just imagine what that would have been like. We got along very well. That's good. Yeah. No, because... But he wouldn't have been like working with Nimoy. No. I was busy doing something else, I recall. Sure. I, I don't remember what, but... Uh. <laughs> um, would, you, would you mind talking a little bit about The Last Starfighter, uh, which is one of my wife's favorite films of all time. I'm not kidding. Too. Yeah, it's great. Uh, how challenging was it to distinguish that from other space opera films? You know, you just done Star Trek. Uh, everyone naturally compares The Last Starfighter to Star Wars. Uh, how difficult was it to set it apart from things that had been that had been made well, previously? Well, I thought of it as just a continuation, not so much retread, retread or different. I think it was different, but it was. If I had done Star Trek. In place of that, I would have continued to make the aliens different, I think. And that, that's, is that what you're talking sure. about? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. I just wondered if you, if you had given it much thought at the time, if, if, you, if, if you had to like, consciously make sure, okay, let's not make this look too Star Wars, because Star Wars is popular, and we don't want it to look like a knockoff. Well, that's, yeah, I did think about that. But I was, enjoyed working with Bob Preston so much. Yeah. You talk a lot about him in your book. Oh, he was ideal. His yeah, you said that was the most pleasant experience you'd ever had working with an actor. Well, with the, his behavior toward everybody and it was, it was uh, phenomenal. 
Do you ever go back and watch the films you worked on? I wouldn't turn them off, but I might not go and <laughs> try and look at them. Uh, Sounds a movie night in our future. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I believe so. That, the, that's the, <laughs> the main thing I'm getting from this interview is I really want to sit down and watch one or two of your movies with you. I would like to watch some of the other movies, Star Trek, actually. I'm curious. That would be a lot of fun as well, yeah. But, uh, and, and, I, and I would love to get, to get your thoughts on some of them. Well, I'll... I gave you my thoughts on the last one. On the last one, yeah. Well, and may I say, uh, as much as for this current franchise, I really enjoyed Beyond uh, much more than the other two, uh, but you worked on the best of them. Most, most certainly, hands down. Um, I mean, I mean the bit, we, we have 13 Star Trek films now. You worked on the best of them. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talk a little bit about um, April Ferry and working on uh, research for sketches for uh, the TV show Rome, uh, which I was a, a big admirer of when that was on. Well, she's my dearest friend. We've worked, worked together over 40 years. She also was a performer. She started life in showbiz as a dancer. Uh, Jack Cole, Jack Cole, Jack Cole dancer. Do you know what that means? Well, the dancers know, <laughs> <laughs> and Jack Cole has a cer certain style and a very active uh, physical style. She was one. Have, have you ever seen Kismet, the musical? I haven't. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I knew this would happen because I am just not a big musical guy. <laughs> oh, well, but you like design and you like uh, writing and you like... Yeah. I need to spend more time at the theater, most certainly. Yeah. I chastised him. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> he is. Anyway, she was one of the Ababu princesses in Kismet. Uh, which and she had her they had three girls and they had their own number with swords it was a kind of a Turkish murderous Turkish dance number uh, she was very happy she didn't lose part of her arm <laughs> show closed anyway she was performer and she married one of the strong men from uh, Kismet who carried Joan Diener around on a palanquin the sound of cymbals and drums and he is still alive but he became a notorious he was one of the best after he got out of that show he became a uh, prop man in in uh, the movies, which is one of the powerful positions. I mean, a prop man is the one who keeps the c company tranquil and supplied with uh, food and drink and many yeah. other things. But he he got to be a terrible drunk. And um, she had three children with him, finally couldn't stand it anymore, and divorced him. And the only thing she could think of doing at that time was to go into wardrobe. So she started carrying costumes. <laughs> and she carried costumes for me on the Dean Martin show. Although, uh, and that was in 1970. And we've been working together ever since. And our last gig was uh, Game of Thrones. Oh, wow. She was a designer and I was a sketch artist. I didn't realize you worked at all on that show. Yeah. That's great. For the last last year, that was until uh, she had a stroke and is blind. Oh. But, oh, Rome. Uh, yeah. We took her and her children to Rome for the first time in the late 70s for Christmas, and she fell in love with Italy. 
and she got very familiar with with a lot of people there and she I don't know quite how it is I think she anyhow <laughs> through through that Christmas time she met some of the tele uh, production people in Italian TV <coughs> and she got to be familiar with the producer I'm not saying that in any nasty way, simply they were very friendly and she was hired to do Rome. And she hired me because she didn't know anything about history. She, <laughs> she, like, I've been there before and I liked it and that's what I know. What I planned to be was an archaeologist. Oh. And uh, so I started out with... Your major? Ma major. And I was going to ask you about that earlier, uh, when when you were studying at Harvard and mostly doing uh, show business, what you what your official major actually was. Well, first it was archaeology, and then when I realized that it took a lot a lot of work, <laughs> I was I majored in um, history and literature. So, and I've always loved it. So. Anyway, I did all the research for April on that. I'm going to interject. The reason why they love Bob to do all of the sketches is he paints in the props and what the set should look like and all of the other aspects on each sketch. So it is totally fulfilling. And when we get them, we make copies and pass them to the props department and to the scenic and to that. And everybody is able to say they get the whole history of the show from the costume sketches because Bob is so historically um, educated and correct on it. So that's what, and most of the time in costuming, that's not what you get. You get just a rendering, period. You and don't get anything with it. And from what I saw from the the, the uh, photos included in, in your book, we're talking all kinds of cultures all over the world. It seems like you've studied everything. Well, I once had a library of 5,000 volumes. Uh, that has dwindled to about 2,000 that April has in Los Angeles. And I think they're hoping they will be transferred here because she can't work anymore. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Which is very sad. Yeah. But it's wonderful that you're able to still work. And and, and, and again, you, you, keep, well, you keep thinking you're finished, and then you work on something else. So when I got up this morning, I thought maybe this is the end because I was oh, finding it difficult to talk. Perfect for an interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, you're, you, you seem to be feeling all right now. Well, I am. You cheered me up. <laughs> <laughs> that makes my day. Tell me uh, a little bit about Orson Welles. He was the most enchanting irritating, <laughs> inspiring, and naughty man I've ever known. In my bedroom, I have two photographs up. One of is Orson Welles, and the other one is Lincoln Kirsten. Those were the two people who really inspired me. Orson was a genius. He was totally inspired and he could have been the greatest director of all time but he lost his self respect or something or other because self worth you know he hard for me to talk because i should write it down first sure but um, i was blessed to work with him quite a lot. Because one thing, he and Dean Martin were dear friends. I didn't know that. And that was the next person I was going to ask you about. And Orson came on, was a guest on Dean's show many, many times. And they were close. And <clears throat> not only that, he was close to uh, Greg Garrison, the producer of the Dean, Dean Martin's show. So 
Orson was when he was broke, which was always. Yeah. He was there was always a moment when he was hired for, by Dean and Greg, and uh, I was lucky enough to be on the show at one point when um, I don't know, I can't quite recall how it started, but I started producing a movie with Orson and Dean. Dean was not in it. He was part of the pro uh, production money. And we got, <coughs> we went to NBC and raised the money for a script that Orson wrote on, what is it, that one, about the uh, well, volcano. It's a novel, Below the Volcano. Oh, okay, okay. Right? Well, Orson wrote a wonderful script. Dean and Greg and I took it to NBC and they gave us the money. And we were about to start production. And the only problem was that Orson wanted to star in it as well as direct it. And we were trying to get him not to do that. And um, suddenly all the executives at NBC who had given us the money were fired and replaced. So we had to go back to NBC for the money. And they said, oh, well, you know, we're really not interested in uh, Below the Volcano, but if you would do a movie about Orson and his uh, and Rita Hayworth, <laughs> now we, that would be interesting. And uh, I said, I don't think we can take that to Orson. <laughs> I guess it's kind of unfortunate that we never saw that, but then it sounds like you really didn't want Orson to act in it. Or... Well, and the problem is he always took on too much. Mm -hmm. I played Edgar in a production of King Lear with him, and he directed, scripted, told me what to design. <laughs> and was he always that way? Did, did he seem to yes. be incapable of being involved in something that he didn't have full control over? I, th I presume I didn't see him that in all his life, but that's the way he ha behaved. And yet he could make you love it until you got to the point where you wanted to kill him. <laughs> It's interesting that you mentioned that uh, that early in this, in his career he was all he was already broke and taking jobs uh, just to put food on the table because he had a, a, a massive reputation for that later in life where well, he, where he, it seemed he would just take anything that came his way. Well, he had to because he liked to live the high life, baby. Always, he had to and, find some way to support that. And he was kind of lifestyle. I mean, if you sat down to have lunch with him. It would be a put and take. Are you sure you want that chop? <laughs> hey, how about that roll? <laughs> he would. He, he ate. He was a. He was an. He, he ate life, but I admired him a lot. But if you had gone through a rehearsal of King Lear of three weeks with him, and came to the dress rehearsal a week and found yourself locked backstage <laughs> and the only person outside in the auditorium was Orson Welles <laughs> with a <laughs> megaphone and he liked it. he rehearsed 24 hours a day <laughs> and that voice he has the voice of God yeah voice of God I'm sorry he's gone yeah, and he passed mid to late 80s, yeah. what, 85, 86? Mm -hmm. I was doing North and South. Kirstie Alley again. Yeah. Do you know her? Well, she's in Wrath of Khan. Uh, just, I, just, I just mentioned it because you worked with her at least a couple of times. Heaven. Yeah. Mm hmm <laughs> Really? Heaven. Anyway, I was in Charleston. We had a wonderful southern mansion. And the news came that Orson had died, and Greg called me, and I couldn't help it. I burst into tears. Yeah. Right there on the 
in the restaurant where he got a hold of me. I just want to talk to you about a couple of other things. You you uh, you, you talk in your in your book about something I wasn't really aware of, which is um, D- D- Dean Martin and his uh, g- kind of uh, uh, like like social anxieties. Hmm. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, and just about about working with Dean Martin, you know, in general. And and, and you talk in your book about how he rarely would uh, rehearse with anyone because he was just so nervous around people, and then he would go out on stage and give a perfect performance, like he didn't need to. Well, that was the way he behaved. It worked. He was extremely intelligent, but he thought he wasn't. Yeah. And he was embarrassed. I mean, he didn't mind being around uh, nightclub people and things like that, but um, if if he had to be near uh, someone he respected as being intellectually more accomplished or something, it he made him very nervous. And as far as the rehearsing is concerned, it's quite true. He was much better doing it once, once, and not doing it over and over. And there are a lot of people in the business who want to rehearse everything, particularly a comedy sketch. They want to go over and over and over it. And he made a number of, uh, not enemies, but people who didn't want to work with him because of the fact that he would not rehearse with them. The producer, Greg Garrison, believed firmly that Dean was best when he did something once. So he he didn't push Dean in any way. So Dean sat in his dressing room and watched whoever the guest star was with actually the music director who read the Dean's part. That's who did the stand-in. Yeah, and of course, the the uh, I guess I guess the the irony there is if he uh, did do what people wanted him to, working with him, you wouldn't have gotten as good a perf- of a performance out of him. Yeah, right. And he was very nice to work with. He was not grand or demanding in any way. I liked him. I hope he liked me. We got along. I. Worked with him and you were for there for a long time. Eleven years. Wow, I didn't know it was that long. Yeah, when I came on the show, he was very difficult about wearing costumes. You had, and the, most all of the sketches had him in a an Arab costume or in a priest co- or some some kind of costume for a lot of the sketches. And apparently, before I came on the show. He would not take off his tuxedo. Everything had to go on over. And for some reason, on the second show, he decided he liked the way I worked or something, and he actually took off his tuxedo. (laughs) And he was not a drunk. That was an act. Yeah, and you talked about some other... If folks in your in your book, I forget who exactly who would who were good at pretending to be drunk. Yeah, it seemed like uh, that was a big comedic sketch comedy uh, thing right, right then. Uh, well, there's a, a one guy I can't even remember his name now. He's very nice, but that was his entire act. It was never totally drunk. But it was drunk enough to be <laughs> noticeable. <laughs> Why don't we go ahead and wrap things up? Uh, let me ask you this, the, the, and, and, I, and I know that obviously the last um, the, the, the last several years, the last couple of decades, you haven't been as involved in the Hollywood side of things. But uh, just from what you've been able to glean uh, from the way movies are made now, what would you say are the couple of biggest differences between how we're making films now, production side of things, versus when you were when you were making the Star Trek? Well, there's but. Spending millions and billions on special effects and not on a story or dialogue or actual scenes between people. It's, um, well, you know, it's <laughs> car, uh, car chases and yeah. explosions and catastrophe. 
Yeah, I, uh, I I spoke to um, an, an actor a few years back uh, doing an interview uh, named Wally Winger who worked with uh, Adam West some, and he said these days movies want to be video games and video games want to be movies, yeah. and I think that's I, yeah. I think that that is some where we're at now. Very accurate. I, 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 I'm not against like action movies. Sure. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I don't want everything in it. And everything in every movie to be action. And you do have things that purport to be more character driven, where it does feel like you're kind of you're kind of watching people chasing each other or fighting or um, without without a lot of emotional resonance behind it for ten or twenty minutes. Uh, the best which, thing I've think the and there's a place for everything. I've certainly. seen lately, and I, I'm very unhappy because I keep missing it. It's a, a Victoria. I haven't seen that. <laughs> so good. Oh, I know. I'll bring it over. I own I've it. only seen one section, but I know it's good. I own it. I'll bring it over. <laughs> Thank you. It's really, 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 really good. I mean, the, when the British do it, they do it, believe me. And I saw a section on their costume design as well, and um, she's using fabrics that would only have been available at the time. She's oh, not wow. using That's nuts. any synthetics, and it's... And she's using sketches yes. that are in the news. Mm -hmm. And uh, I watched an interview with her. It was fantastic. I once saw. It sounds like one of the most period accurate things it, ever. It's close. Yeah. It, there, there are some things, and she even admits that there were some comfort issues that they had to use plastic boning. Mm -hmm. But other than that, everything is. Because it just wasn't practical to ask it, people it wasn't to wear those practical things. It was practical, and it's incredibly expensive to get steel and bone is now illegal. Naturally. Well, yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> if you could see the look oh, on Bob's face right now. Look <laughs> what ivory I've got over there. Yeah. Don't say that too loudly. It's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> I can cut that part out if you want me to. But otherwise, you can take your life in your hands. Sorry. I once had some prints that were a Victoria's coronation and everything was designed I mean the maids in waiting had special dresses and with special kind of flowers and my god she copied that it's, it's I'll bring it it's really good <laughs> it's really really good and they're starting second season already uh -huh. they've started filming well and I'd like to have you bring him some Star Trek Yes, I, I have those as well. I will I've been thinking that this whole time. I'll bring back I'll bring by my Star Trek collection. I have all of them. I might steal it. <laughs> Bob, if I may, I'm gonna make you a short list. I'm gonna I'm gonna make you a list of five or six things based on the things you worked on that I that, that I think you should see and you get a kick out of to see how how things evolved from your designs and how you influenced the the shows moving forward. Well that I'd like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me into your home and letting me chat with you for an hour. And well, thank you for much, so much for coming here. Yeah. Because, uh, the, the thought of going out is uh, something that I don't entertain very much. Yeah, it's understandable. Well, I'm I'm really glad that uh, that you allowed me to do it. So, thank you very much. Folks, uh, thanks a lot for listening. We sure appreciate it. And uh, as I've been saying on every video for the last couple of weeks, uh, I'm taking a hiatus to write a novel. I will be back uh, shortly with a couple of other little timely things here in the interim, but uh, mostly I am still on hiatus. Thanks a lot for listening. I am Captain Logan, and uh, this was Bob Fletcher. Pushing broom buys a 8 for 12 for bedroom, I'm a man.